open by reading our mission statement. The Oregon Mycological Society is an educational and scientific organization. Its mission is to study, collect, and identify fungi, to educate members and the public in fungi identification, and to promote health and safety in the gathering and consumption of fungi. We are a volunteer-run society organized as a nonprofit corporation. that everything that happens within this group um, is done because we love it. We love mushrooms. We are fungal fanatics, a lot of us. Um, and it doesn't really matter what you're into. Uh, there's something that has brought all of us here. Um, many of us see them as teachers and learn life lessons from the way that they connect our world, share information, feed our minds and bodies, and even help us heal. I think it's beautiful that here tonight, mushrooms have connected us all. I love the community I get out of being a part of OMS, and I'm so grateful I get to be here and myceliate with you all. <laughs> um, so with that, we do have some opportunities for you to get involved. Um, as we've been starting to beat the drum for our 75th anniversary picnic party at Kelly Point Park on July 14th, um, we do have some event events to engage as we lead um, one of the highlights of the picnic is going to be our version of a mushroom art scavenger hunt called Game of Shrooms. While this event happens on an international level, ours will be a downscaled version for the day. Um, summer is not known for uh, being a season that we find a lot of mushrooms in the forest, so we're going to plant our own and what you find you get to see. We have a, um, several craft sessions that are going to be held leading up to that. Um, we do have a number of people that are willing to donate some craft supplies. They may ask for a $5 donation or something along those lines if you want to use some of the things that they brought. Um, otherwise, the focus is definitely on um, buying as little as, uh, as we can, um, you know, kind of pulling together our supplies and just having fun making mushroom art. Um, the first of these craft sessions is going to be on Saturday. April 27th from 3.30 to 6 p.m. Um, I will be sending out an email for that event this weekend. So if you are interested, you can sign up. Um, then there's going to be another one in May um, and another one in June. Um, those dates might be shifting a little bit, so those will be announced. Um, and so that's that slide. If you are interested in Coming involved with the 75th uh, anniversary committee, you can email me, um, OMS president at wildmushrooms.org. Um, and yeah, we'll we'll start involving people. Um, I know some of you have probably seen emails going out, but we are trying to get people on different committees involved just so it's a representation of all of OMS. Um, we are also hoping to uh, work on the historical aspect a little bit. Um, I do know that as a fundraiser, one of our members, um, Erica, who's also our secretary, brought some books, a uh, little, oh, actually, never, never mind. <laughs> On a, another time, we'll, uh, we'll have a little something that you can uh, purchase to donate to the event. Uh, moving on. We have two OMS dye workshops. So, uh, 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 so Ellen Birnbaum will be teaching two fiber dyeing with mushroom classes um, within the next few days. Again, I think this is going to be a weekend thing as I uh, master it and break. Um, you're going to get an email with a link for registration. So each class is going to have a limit of 10 people and they are both one day workshops. Um, we are asking that you only sign up for one uh, to make sure that as many members as possible can have access to these. Um, they are a big deal, and they do um, fill up very quickly. Oh, and okay, so the dates, yes, the dates are on there. So April 27th, and then again on May 18th. Um, I think those are all the new offerings I have to announce. Um, hopefully some of you were able to sign up for our spring myco camp happening in May, or are taking one of our identification classes. Um, a lot of people are missing tonight because they are in our ID classes. Um, and with that, 
I am going to pass the microphone on over to Pat. Oh, George, our speaker. Kim Brown. <laughs> She'll introduce Pat O. <laughs> Thanks, Shana. Thanks, Shana, for everything that you're doing. Oh my gosh. Uh, I'm so appreciative to have a president who's uh, working so hard for the group. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Kim Brown. I'm the speaker coordinator. I've been in this position since uh, 2007. Always. Um, and just to let you know that. Uh, we're going to have some great speakers coming up this year. Next month is uh, um, Alan Rockefeller, for those who, who know him. And uh, next to the month after that, in June, will be uh, Britt Bunyard will be visiting. And either in August or September, we will have Dan Miller. And maybe for November, we're looking at a culinary event. So if you um, have any ideas, any topics that you want, a good speakers that you can recommend. Uh, feel free to either talk to me, bring me the names, the topics, or email me at programs at wildmushroom.org and I'm happy to do the digging and looking for you. And uh, also with that, um, talking about our website and uh, uh, people taking the class today, the ID class. For those of you who are members, dig around on the website. There's lots of stuff out there and we also have um, ID classes on there and some exclusive videos for members. So dig around, see what you've got. Um, I know the website can be a little intimidating, but please, please do, lots of stuff out there. And with that, now we'll introduce Pat. Thank you. Uh, my name is Pat Okubara. I am a member of the OMS Scholarship Committee, so I get to introduce tonight's speaker. Teddy Borland. Teddy received uh, an old man scholarship in 2003. So uh, she grew up in a small town near Chicago and migrated westward ish to Colorado, where she earned um, a bachelor's degree in botany at Colorado State University, Boulder. And at that time, she got interested in how pathogens interact with their host. I think it's this interest that brought her even more westward to Oregon, uh, where she's pursuing a PhD in the lab of David Chen. Did I say Corporal? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, anyway, it's it's been fun uh, talking with Teddy. She has pet dogs and she has a pet turtle. Yeah. <laughs> um, she is into climbing, reading. And also, of course, mushroom cooking. So I think we're all in the right place. So uh, Teddy will talk about um, fusarium. Uh, fusarium, which is a huge genus of filaments or gels. And she's going to talk about different aspects of how fusarium interact or impact um, agriculture management and innovation. And she'll also Bit about her okay. Thank you for that very nice introduction, Pat. I really appreciate it. Um, so I am really excited to talk to all of you today about fusarium and kind of the fascinating world of it um, in the past four and a half years, I've really discovered a lot of interesting things about this genus, and so I can't wait to tell you about it. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> so I just want to start with uh, some acknowledgments before I get into it. Um, so first, I want to acknowledge my lab. So I'm in da Dr. David Gent's lab at Oregon State University in the Department of Botany and Plant Pathology. And I especially, especially want to call out um, Heidi Nunemacher up there. She's helped me with a ton of this research uh, and been really wonderful. Um, and I want to thank our collaborators, as well as hop growers across the Pacific Northwest um, for letting us sample from their hop yards. And of course, especially OMS, I really appreciate the funding 
and the opportunity to talk to all of you today. So, um, so today I'm going to be starting with an introduction to the genus Fusarium, um, and then I'll move into some examples of Fusarium in different contexts uh, before talking about uh, my research and the pathosystem that I focus on. So to start, sorry, let me see if I can get this working. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Okay. Oh, it's okay. I got it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so moving into our introduction um, to Fusarium. So this is a uh, fungal, the phylogeny of fungi. Um, so I, it is a huge group. Um, and many of you may have seen this before in other presentations or in things you've read. And um, most of what you all talk about and see outside is the Basidiomycota. So that's kind of our classic mushrooms uh, that we um, see. But today I'll be talking about a group in the Ascomycota. So the Ascomycota is a later diverging group in fungi. Um, and it contains so many different fungi. Uh, most of the plant pathogens are in the Ascomycota. Um, yeasts are, but we're going to be focusing in the Physizomycotina, which contains some familiar friends like morels, and I'm sure some of you have been finding them so far um, this year. This is from a couple years ago, um, as well as um, some garden foes. So. That's powdery mildew of hop up there. Um, but a lot of the uh, plant pathogens that you might see in your garden are in this group. So um, moving into what is Fusarium? It is a genus in the phylum, Ascomycota. Um, it's this really diverse group um, that's most commonly associated with plant pathogens. But um, it's also found in human and animal systems as well as, um, as, well as a pathogen. Um, and then we also see some industrial uses uh, for, that can benefit us in the end. The other really cool thing about Fusarium, it's quite well known for its production of secondary metabolites, um, including mycotoxins, which can have a really huge impact on humans and animals. So I'm going to start uh, with a little bit of background on the biology of Fusarium. So it's a really interesting group. It's capable of producing up to four different spore types. Um, so for the asexual spores, we have three different types. Um, the top up here is the macroconidia. So those are their kind of charismatic banana-shaped spores um, that are super interesting. Uh, and those are formed in these big masses of mycelium called sporodokia. Uh, they also have teeny spores, the microconidia. Um, those are usually one to three cells large. And they, um, they're, because they're much smaller, they're usually used for wind dispersal. Um, they're born airily in the mycelium. Um, and then finally, we have chlamydospores. So chlamydospores are um, double-walled circular spores they're melanized as well. And so these are hardened spores for overwintering in a lot of the Fusarium species. Um, what's really interesting is they're born in quite a few different ways, but sometimes they'll even form within the macroconidia cells. So sometimes you get these rounded banana shaped uh, spores under the microscope. And then the fourth spore type is the sexual spores. Um, and those are called ascospores. Um, they are born within sacs called asci or an ascus, um, and that's shown right here. And uh, that is what the group is named for, the ascomycota. Often they're called the sac fungi because of this ascus that's present in many species. And in Fusarium specifically, they're born in something called a parathecium. Um, and this is also a hardened, uh, usually mel melanized structure that can be used for overwintering. So now that we've talked a little bit about the biology, I wanted to 
just give a little bit of background in relationships among fusarium species. So fusarium is often um, broken into species complexes. I know this is a gigantic table. We're not going to go too in depth, I promise. Um, but it's often broken into species complexes that contain similar species. Uh, and as you can see, oh, <laughs> that's okay. Um, they can vary quite a bit um, in mycotoxin production. So this table is showing um, different mycotoxins that are produced and they're marked in blue on the table. And at the very top there, um, that is the Fusarium sambucinum species complex, um, which is really a hot spot for mycotoxin production. It contains a lot of kind of famous Fusarium species, uh, including Fusarium graminiarum and Colmorum, uh, which are causal agents in head blight, um, as well as Fusarium sambucinum, which we'll be talking a lot more about later in this talk. Um, as well as Fusarium venenatum. But, so talking a little bit about mycotoxins because they're so important in this group. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, so these are toxic compounds produced by fungi, um, hence the name mycotoxins. Um, they're a really important feature of Fusarium species, like I mentioned, um, because they can have major impacts on humans, cattle, and plant hosts. Uh, so this graphic here from Monkbold et al. in 2021 uh, just shows a bunch of different mycotoxins that are produced in the Fusarium genus. Um, what's really interesting here is you can see that they vary from really simple, tiny structures like the manila formin up to Fuminosins up there or fusarians here, these really complex secondary metabolites that um, are formed using these really complex set of genes that are called uh, secondary metabolite biosynthetic gene clusters. Um, so it's a really interesting element of this group. Now, um, I'm going to move on to some examples of fusarium in different contexts. Um, and these are uh, pretty variable. Um, so they range, Fusarium is this really interesting genus that can fill a lot of different ecological niches. Um, so it ranges from being a plant pathogen and impacting us in that way, like in our agriculture or in our gardens, to producing mycotoxins um, that can be toxic to humans and animals, as well as direct disease in these systems as well. But we also see um, some direct benefits from uh, fusarium, including some food products and the production of secondary metabolites. So I'm going to start with um, the fusarium and food. So has anyone had these products before? Yeah? Um, so both of these are um, made using fusarium. Uh, so I'll start by talking about corn over here. I have had this one. It's pretty good. It's a it's a uh, meatless alternative uh, product. Um, and so this is formed using this fungus called Fusarium venenatum. This is actually closely related to Fusarium sambucinum, um, which I'll talk a lot more about later. Um, and what they do is they found this isolate of Fusarium venenatum that doesn't produce mycotoxins, which of course is very important. And um, it forms these like dense mycelial mats that um, they're able to harvest and they call it mycoproteins and they form it into these various meatless products. Um, this was first sold in the 1980s in the UK and then in the US, I think it was like the 90s or 2000s that it first was sold here. Um, but this one you can find in, in most grocery stores um, if you haven't had it yet. Now this, uh, Nature's Find, this is one I just learned about recently, and it's a really interesting story. So they use this species, Fusarium strain flavolapis, that was actually discovered in geothermal vents in Yellowstone. Um, so it's this fungus that's able to survive these really intense environments in the geothermal vents. And they originally were trying to use it um, to produce biofuels, but they realized it could form this mycoprotein and it didn't produce um, mycotoxins. 
And now they're using it to make meatless products and I guess uh, dairy-free cream cheese as well. Um, and so this one was first released in 2021. Um, I want to try it sometime. I think it's sold at like Whole Foods and Sprouts. Um, so we don't have that in Corvallis, but. <laughs> so moving on to another use for fusarium, a beneficial use, um, is the secondary metabolites that I talked about earlier. Um, even some considered mycotoxins can be harnessed for human benefit. So one element is antimicrobials. So a lot of these secondary metabolites that fusarium produces have antimicrobial properties. Um, and for them, they're able to reduce competition by producing these compounds. Um, but we could potentially use it in many different contexts. Additionally, fusarium produce um, tons of really wild pigments. So here you can see, these are all different fusarium species. Um, and they produce wildly different colors. And so people are actually able to grow up fusarium species in different media types and extract um, those pigments and, and use them in different con industrial contexts. And then another thing that they're looking at fusarium is uh, for biofuel production. Um, this is the element that I'm least familiar with, but they have been looking at it to help produce biofuels in, in different contexts. So um, a lot of different uses for fusarium uh, that is super cool. Uh, would, would you correctly say that uh, mushrooms and cousins with very important types of biology that were substances? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is in the hypocryllies. So I, I guess it would be, if, if cordyceps is in the hypocryllies, it would be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to the negative side of the secondary metabolites, which is the mycotoxins. So um, this is kind of an indirect negative impact on human, humans and animals. Uh, and they call it mycotoxicosis when the mycotoxins are ingested. Um, some of the really important toxins are deoxynivalenol, also known as vomitoxin, um, and T2 toxin and fuminosins that are produced by various fusarium species. Um, often, mycotoxicosis occurs um, after people ingest food, con food contaminated with mycotoxins. Now, this is pretty rare. You know, we have really thorough testing processes now. Um, but historically, there have been uh, some major problems like where there is uh, fatal levels of mycotoxins ingested um, through food, especially grain. Um, and then the really big thing that um, a lot of people are studying is grain that has been infested with fusarium um, and is contaminated with mycotoxin uh, and then used for feed for animals. So this can be a really big impact in cattle um, systems because um, if you get enough toxin accumulation, uh, it can be fatal for different animals. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about disease in animalia uh, caused by fusarium. So fusarium can be opportunistic pathogens in humans. Um, so they um, usually, it'll only occur in people who are immunocompromised. Um, they don't typically target uh, outside of that range. Um, but when people are infected with fusarium, it's called fusariosis. Um, I am super sensitive to graphic medical images, so I just have some icons up here. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so the fusariosis in humans can range from local infections, um, such as skin infections or in eyes. Um, some feet infections can occur. <laughs> um, but it also can be systemic, and that can be a really big issue. It can get into the bloodstream in some cases, um, and there are also some lung infections that have occurred from fusarium. So um, it can be a real problem. It also is a pathogen in animal systems as well. Um, so one example is sea turtle egg fusariosis. Um, so it's an infection in sea turtle eggs where they um, are non-viable after infection. That's OK. <laughs> um, and then, no, <laughs> totally good. Um, 
And then also equine keratitis. So that's a skin infection in horses. So um, it is pretty wild how diverse of a host range that Fusarium can have. Now, after this, I'll move into plant systems. So I'm a plant pathologist, and so this is really my area of expertise. Um, and I want to talk about a few um, really historically important diseases in plants, um, and then one really cool example. So starting with Fusarium head blight. So uh, this is a disease in cereals um, caused by several Fusarium species, mainly Fusarium graminearum and Fusarium colmorum. As you can see, it causes um, dieback in the wheat or barley spikes. Um, and it can have a pretty big impact on crop yield as well, and definitely crop quality. Um, and so there is a crop risk. And the really big thing here is the mycotoxin contamination. So this is deoxynivalenol um, or vomitoxin, like I mentioned earlier. Um, and this is a, a deadly toxic toxin that's produced by Fusarium graminearum in the infected uh, in the infected wheat heads or, or barley or rye. Um, and so if you get infected uh, wheat from a field, that can lead to cattle toxicity or potentially to humans as well. So that's why this disease has been a really big deal and continues to be a big deal um, in terms of plant pathology. Another well-known fusarium pathosystem is fusarium wilt of banana. Um, this is a pretty interesting story. So we used to grow, I think, I think it was before the 1950s, um, we used to only pretty much grow this cultivar called Gros Michel. And so this banana cultivar was supposed to be really delicious, but it was super susceptible to a fusarium um, pathogen, fusarium oxysperum, forme specialis cubens, cubensi. Um, and it causes this really severe wilting and dieback in banana plantations. Um, and so ultimately, because the Gros Michel was so susceptible to this disease, we completely lost that crop. And we were pretty worried about whether uh, we could keep growing bananas at all. Luckily, they found another cultivar, Cavendish, which is what we normally see in the grocery store right now. Um, and that was uh, totally resistant to fusarium wilt. But in the last couple of years, we've actually started to see susceptibility in this cultivar that is now kind of our monoculture that's growing. So there's a lot of research going on right now uh, looking at banana resistance and fusarium oxysperum to try and overcome that and develop new varieties. Um, yeah. And then finally, this is just a really cool example. <laughs> um, so these are called pseudoflowers. Can anybody tell me from A to, C to D, uh, which of these is the real flower? You can just shout it out. Yeah, so it is D. But it's pretty wild how similar it looks to the other photos, right? So all of these, A through C, are buds that are infected with Fusarium xerophyllum. Um, this is yellow-eyed grass, um, zero species. And so the fungus has started to grow on these buds in the same color and similar formation to the flower. And that's why they're called pseudo flowers. This paper is really, really cool. It's uh, Iman Laraba et al. I highly recommend reading it if you're interested. Um, but the other really interesting thing about this pathosystem is one, that mass is actually a mass of mycelium. So there are actually a couple other fungi, um, fungal plant pathogens, that produce these pseudo flowers. Um, but this is the only one that I know of that produces the pseudo flowers out of a fungal mass, um, which is just pretty wild. And then the other thing is that um, they found that the fungal mass has this UV reflectance. Um, that's really similar to how the flower would look to a pollinator. Um, so it's essentially they're finding that this is a form of mimicry. The pollinators will come and be attracted to it and spread it to other flowers. So just a really interesting 
system. So fusarium, is it a friend or is it a foe? It really depends. Um, we have a lot of different contexts that we've talked about so far where we see it benefiting us in a lot of different ways, but also it can cause major harm. Um, so it's really dependent and it's really interesting to study. So now that I've gone through some introduction to the genus um, and some examples, I'm gonna move into my research um, and starting with an introduction to the disease I study. Does anyone recognize what this is? Yeah, awesome, okay. <laughs> so this is a hop yard out of the growing season, um, between growing seasons. And this is a hop yard uh, at the peak of a growing season. So they are these giant plants that are grown on 18 to 20 foot trellises. Um, the scientific name is Humulus lupulus. Uh, the way that hops are grown is they have an annu annual shoot and perennial roots. So each year, this whole shoot grows up to the top of the trellis, and at the end of each growing season, it's cut down to harvest the hops. Um, so like I said, it's 18 to 20 foot trellises, and they take about one to three years to reach maturity. And after that, a hop yard can be in for anywhere from you know, five to 20 years. Um, and so they're a pretty long-term crop once you plant a hop yard. Um, and of course, the primary product from these plants is hops. So these are hops. Um, so they are the flower of the plant that's harvested. Um, and so the primary use for hops, as many of you might be familiar with, is in beer. Um, that is due to the lupulin glands that are present in the flowers. Um, so these lupulin glands produce lupulin, which is just full of secondary metabolites that uh, flavor beers, they kind of produce the bitter flavor in beers. Um, this is a high value crop in the Pacific Northwest especially. So we grow um, the vast majority of hops in the United States across Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. Um, especially Washington, it's about 70% of the hop production is in Washington. And the US is actually the leading producer of hops in the world um, as of a couple years ago, we were neck and neck with Germany for a while, but um, now we've moved to the front. And um, major diseases of hop that growers deal with are powdery mildew and downy mildew. Any gardeners in the crowd are probably pretty familiar um, with these diseases, as well as fusarium canker. So fusarium canker is an emerging disease in hop. Um, it was not super prevalent uh, 10 or 20 years ago in the Pacific Northwest, but just recently, um, it's becoming increasingly problematic. This is due to a couple reasons, um, potentially. Uh, climate change can play a role, so uh, the change in climate becoming a more favorable environment overall for the disease, as well as some level of agricultural intensification, so growing more varieties of hop that have um, more susceptibility to the disease. But you can see it can be really problematic if it's happening a lot in a hop yard, um, if we have a high incidence because of this total dieback that we see. Now, because it historically wasn't a huge issue in the Pacific Northwest, fairly little is known about the disease epidemiology and management, um, which necessitates further study. So just walking through some of the symptoms of this disease. So this is the canker that it's named after. Um, it forms kind of this bulbous point at the uh, point that the fungus uh, infects the plant. And then um, this is the swelling and the girdling symptom. So this symptom is really, really important. What happens is it constricts the plant so severely that it ultimately completely detaches from the rest of the plant. Um, and so this disease is primarily occurring at the crown of the plant, so at the base of vines. Um, hops are, I, I forgot to mention this earlier, but hop stems are called vines, which are similar to vines, um, but slightly different in how they crawl up their surfaces. Um, so 
But anyway, we see this severe girdling where it completely detaches from the rest of the plant. And um, that leads to wilting and complete dieback of the vines. Um, and so it can be a pretty serious issue. This disease is primarily associated with Fusarium sambucinum and has historically been associated with this species. Fusarium sambucinum produces these really beautiful bright orange <laughs> sporadochia. Um, here you can see a sporadochium under the microscope and you can see some of that pigmentation as well. Um, they produce really classic macroconidia, the banana-shaped multicellular um, spores. And then on PDA, I like to call it sunset coloration. Um, so often you'll see kind of an orange to pink coloration. Um, and so Fusarium sambucinum is actually the type species of the Fusarium genus. Um, it's been reported in up to 128 hosts. And it's a really important player in a couple of disease complexes. So that includes Fusarium canker. This is a vine that has um, pretty intense infection and sporulation on it. And then dry rot of potato. Um, this is a system that Fusarium sambucinum has most consistently been studied in. You've probably seen it in potatoes that you've gotten from the grocery store. Um, and that's usually defined by this more dry rotting area than you would see in like a bacterial rot that's pretty squishy. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a good question. So the teleomorph of this is uh, Gibberella pulcaris, I think. Um, you can find it sometimes in the Pacific Northwest. We actually don't see both mating types um, historically. So um, I'll talk about the life cycle in just a second, um, and I can talk a little bit more about that. That's a great question. So the macroconidia, they're pretty large. Um, so they're not usually wind dispersed. Um, typically, I would say they either drop and continue to live in the soil. Um, so it can live in the soil or on roots or something like that. Um, or it could be moved around with, I think mechanical is a big way probably where it's um, moving around on the farm machinery that it touches. Um, but the big one here, this is a soil-borne disease. So soil is the name of the game for it. That's gonna be the primary way. Um, and then uh, the final disease complex is cone tip blight of hop. Now this is a fairly minor disease in hop, um, but it is important because it's the other fusarium caused disease in the plant. Um, and Fusarium sambucinum can be a causal agent. So, yeah, so this is a life cycle uh, diagram. I won't spend too much time getting into the nitty gritty here, um, but the really important part is it all starts with a wounded vine. So usually a wound at the base of the vine, um, and that can occur from anything from mechanical injury, from farm equipment, um, to wind injury, knocking the vines around too much, or insects. Uh, creating injury at the base of the vine, and it needs that entry point uh, to get into the plant and ultimately cause infection. And so sometimes we see direct sporulation on the vines um, where it's forming sporadochia on the vines. Fusarium sambucinum doesn't form um, microconidia that frequently, um, so it's mostly macroconidia we see or chlamydospores. Um, and then it also can overwinter on crop debris or in the soil or on rhizomes um, as well. Now, so the sexual cycle is really rare in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and so we don't typically see that, um, but it does occur in, in some other regions. Yeah, it's really only, only referred to as uh, Fusarium sambucinum at this point. Um, but like, if, it is important to know the other name if you're looking literature or something. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's most commonly referred to as fusarium. 
it, there's a lot of talk in the fusarium community about one fungus, one name right now, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, now that I've kind of given an introduction to um, fusarium canker and fusarium sambucinum, I just want to talk a little bit about the goals of my research for my PhD. Um, so I have a pretty broad project that ranges from looking at management tactics for fusarium canker um, to the population diversity of fusarium sambucinum, um, so kind of a large-scale genomics project. Um, I'm also looking at mycotoxin production in fusarium sambucinum. Um, so we're looking at what toxin biosynthetic gene clusters are in the genomes and what toxins are produced. And then I also have some elements of disease ecology in my project, ranging from looking at the host range of Fusarium sambucinum um, to looking at the diversity of Fusarium species that um, can, are present on Fusarium canker infected vines, which I'll be talking more about right now. So now I'm moving into this specific project funded by OMS, um, where we're trying to understand the pathogens involved with this disease. So why do we care about fusarium diversity? Fusarium diseases are often caused by a disease complex. So they're often caused by um, multiple fusarium species that can either cause disease on their own or they kind of work together to cause disease. One example of this is one that I talked about earlier, so head blight of cereals. Um, and uh, a couple species are at play there, like Fusarium graminiarum, Fusarium colmorum. This is important because it can have implications for disease management in the hop yards, ranging from the pathogen host range, so different species could have a different host range, to potentially different disease symptoms, so maybe you could see different symptomology with different species. Um, as well as implications in host resistance breeding. Um, so it's really important to know the genetics there when you're looking at host resistance and potentially fungicide resistance. Now, fungicides aren't typically used for fusarium diseases, um, especially because most of them are soil borne. Um, it's pretty hard to manage that, but it could impact it. So, uh, talking about the methods for the project that I'll be talking about. So it usually starts with identifying diseased plants. So we will walk down a hop yard um, at the peak of the growing season and identify wilted vines in the yard. Um, from there, when we see the wilted vines, we uh, do something we call a tug test. So we go up to the vines and we give them a gentle tug. And because of that severe girdling I talked about earlier, it usually will just pop right off from the rest of the plant. And that's a pretty good indicator that you have fusarium canker. We also sampled from yards across the Pacific Northwest. So we sampled from yards in Oregon, Washington, and Idaho to try and capture the diversity across a geographic scale. And then we also sampled from seven different hop cultivars uh, that are commonly grown. So in order to identify the fusarium species, we start with collecting the diseased tissue, um, and then we isolate the fungus on a fusarium-specific medium. It actually is bright pink, which is kind of fun. <laughs> um, from isolating the fungus, we single spore each um, colony that we isolate, and then we grow up those and collect the tissue to extract DNA from. And from there, we use Sanger sequencing um, on a kind of fusarium specific barcoding region. You might be familiar with the ITS region that's used for a lot of different fungi, um, but we actually use another region called the translation elongation factor one alpha barcoding region um, because ITS isn't quite enough to differentiate between species in the genus. So these are some photos I took of species that we've isolated from hop. You can see there's quite a bit of morphological variation between species here. Um, they produce a lot of different really cool colors and also the mycelium can look really variable um, as well. And looking at this data, um, so this graph is 
the percent of isolates that we um, collected, and these are different Fusarium species we collected. And this graph is uh, based on cultivars. So these are seven cultivars at the top here. Um, and as you can see, Fusarium sambucinum at the top is the most commonly isolated in every single cultivar. That was pretty consistent across all of them. Um, okay. But we did see some other species that were consistently isolated across cultivars as well. Um, so Fusarium oxysporum was also isolated in every single hop cultivar that we sampled from. Um, and then Fusarium solani and Fusarium clavum were both isolated in four of the seven hop cultivars. So it is interesting seeing um, how consistent the different species are across these cultivars. Now, if we look at that data from another lens, um, so this is the percent of isolates um, that we collected in each state that we collected from. So Idaho is in kind of that green blue, Oregon is in red, and then Washington is in yellow. Um, again, we see Fusarium sambucinum was the vast majority of isolates that we collected. But we did see another interesting trend where we saw the greatest diversity of isolates being collected from Washington. So we saw the most diversity in species in Washington. Now that could have something to do with the fact that the most acreage is grown in Washington and perhaps um, that's the reason, but it is interesting. And then I've highlighted here the top five species we isolated. Um, and the reason that these are interesting is that they're candidates for follow-up studies potentially. So that was Fusarium sambucinum, Selenae, Equisidae, Oxysporum, and Regulins. Yeah, so if you, you culture it from the diseased tissue and then you have to single spore it to make sure you aren't picking up anything else that might be growing on the tissue. Um, and then from there, we sequence the, the culture that we've like single spore purified. Um, it's possible. I think when you're culturing from diseased tissue, you're pretty careful to collect from it's like the border of where the disease and the healthy tissue is. And that is where your pathogens are typically most like proliferating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, but it is possible to miss things for sure. And I was focusing on fusarium and using a fusarium specific medium. Um, but yeah. 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 We have like a, a special medium. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I can. I can. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, sorry, I'll repeat the questions afterwards. Um, so moving into the conclusions, uh, as I said, Fusarium sambucinum was the most commonly isolated species, which is great because that supports our hypothesis and what people have been working off of for years in the Fusarium canker system. Um, but we did have some other species isolated consistently from diseased vines. Um, and just to remind you, this could have some importance in disease diagnosis, um, management implications, symptom expression, and host range. So um, a lot of these things can play into when you're studying a pathosystem and trying to manage a pathosystem. Now, the really important thing to stress here is just because I'm isolating all of these species, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're causing disease in the symptoms. Sometimes they can hop in after the plant is already weakened and be more of a secondary pathogen. And sometimes they can just be living on the surface as an endophyte. So it's really important to follow up this data with inoculations to determine if these other species that I'm isolating are actually pathogenic. Um, we call that fulfilling Koch's postulates in pathology. Um, and so, yeah, so future directions for myself and my research. Um, I'm finishing up some other research projects over the next year, including looking at the population diversity of Fusarium sambucinum, the host range of Fusarium sambucinum, management strategies for Fusarium canker, and mycotoxin pr production in Fusarium sambucinum. And ultimately, I'm going to finish graduate school soon. So as... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, as many, as many of you know, uh, it is 
a lot and your brain is in a lot of different places at once. And so it's been a, a really interesting journey, but so much fun learning about Fusarians. And just to put up my acknowledgments again, big thank you to my lab and our collaborators and hop growers, and especially big thank you to all of you and OMS. Um, it's been really awesome talking to you all today. Oh, yeah, I could. Do you, do you want to hear the answer to the isolation question again, or do you want me to? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Teddy, do you have a rough idea of what percentage of the crop that you're seeing now is being affected by this? Oh, that's a really excellent question. So the question is, um, what percentage of the crop is being affected by this disease? So it's really variable. So we're seeing a lot of variation between different yards um, with this disease. And within each yard, it can range from about 1% to about 20% of plants affected, which may seem like a, no, a low number, but when you see how um, bad it can impact those vines, that can be a really, really big impact for hop growers, but it's super variable. Yes? That's a really good question. So the question was, um, is fusarium found on healthy vines where you don't have any disease? The answer is likely yes. So um, fusarium is on pretty much every plant probably out there, um, living as an endophyte. Uh, if you have seen any of like microbiome studies, fusarium is a pretty common genus to, um, to capture in those studies. Um, we have done, I have a, a small, kind of large side project that I did where I looked at fusarium colonization on hop vines before symptom expression. So I collected hop vines really early in the season when they were pretty tiny. Um, and we did detect fusarium sambucinum on hop vines before you would even see symptoms. Um, so it is kind of hanging out. Oh, I think I saw this first. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's a really good question. So um, the question was, uh, what is the purpose or function of all these secondary metabolites for the fungus? So, um, you know, that's a really good question because it's not always known. Um, there are still some mysteries there. Um, it, it takes a lot of energy for the fungus to produce these secondary metabolites. So there has to be some sort of fitness advantage to produce these, um, to take all of that energy to do it. Um, so like I said, uh, some of them have antimicrobial properties. So some of them uh, help with competition with other, um, other microorganisms living in the same environment. They also can impact pathogenicity. So some secondary metabolites and some mycotoxins can help them infect their hosts. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty, pretty wide range of uses. That's a, a really good question. So um, the question was, is do mycotoxins impact the crop itself, potentially contaminating it, or is it just contaminate, or is it just impacting the vines? So um, the mycotoxins, you know, there could be a small risk in uh, the disease I mentioned called cone tip blight, because um, there are species that produce mycotoxins that can cause this disease. Um, but it's such a, you see it in such low levels in hop yards, I don't think it would have a huge issue on that front. Um, now, other ingredients in beer could be a source of mycotoxin contamination, um, such as barley. But um, yeah, in this system and with Fusarium sambucinum, that's mostly going to be impact on crop yield and quality rather than the mycotoxin contamination. 
think that was them. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, if I'm understanding you correctly, um, are the, is it each grower growing a separate cultivar or is there a mix of cultivars being grown? Yeah. Oh yeah, or a preferred cultivar. So yes, it's really driven by the beer industry, what cultivars are being grown. Um, an interesting story is that Citra, which is in a lot of different beers, it has this like citrusy flavor that it'll, it'll add. And it's really popular with hop growers, is, seems to be particularly susceptible to fusarium canker. Um, so even though this plant is kind of getting hit, they can't stop growing it because people really want it in their beers. Um, usually hop growers have um, several different cultivars they'll grow on their um, farms, but yeah, there's kind of consistently cultivars that they grow, especially citra there and cascade and nugget, um, but it can vary. So. That's an, a really awesome question. So um, the question was, have we seen any characteristics in the soil that make the crop more susceptible? Um, and that is an interesting question because we're working on it. <laughs> so um, in our lab, we have a really big study going on where we're looking at um, risk factors for this disease. And part of that inv involves soil sampling. So um, they're sampling the soil and testing uh, the soil like nutrient properties to see if we can find any connection there. Um, so we don't know yet, um, but it is a really good question. Okay. Any? All right. Thank you all so much. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. So the question is, um, is there historical data that we can compare to to see um, what could be the difference and you know why this is an emerging disease? Um, there isn't a lot of concrete data on this disease um, in the United States, at least. It was a problem in, in Europe before it was a big problem here. Um, but yeah, so we don't have historical incidence data. It has been more observational with growers. Um, my PI, Dave Gent, he has a really close connection with the growers in the region. And so he gets a lot of um, kind of one-on-one -on -one input from growers on what their big issues are. So it's more been kind of observational. Um, but now as a part of the big survey study, that's where we're getting some data on at least current um, levels of fusarium canker in yards, um, so yeah. Did he, I, I did. Yeah, so our, our lab, we sequenced all of those. So all of that, we ended up with, I have a collection of like 300 fusarium isolates that we've sequenced. Yeah, so it was a really big undertaking. <laughs> Oh, uh, no, we didn't do it. Yeah. Oh, I sorry, you were asking about the type species, and I'm getting it. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, I think it's like stored as a as a culture because yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of long term storage methods you can use for fungi, like micro fungi. So my guess is that it's stored as a culture. It can be lyophilized and stored, um, but 
yeah, I don't, I don't know for sure. That's not my, my area of expertise. Yeah. Mm, that's a, that's a really, really good question. So the question was, what do the European hop growers do to counteract fusarium? Um, I think it was a mixture of things. Um, you know, one is growing different cultivars. And then there are some cultural management methods you can use. So um, one method is called hilling. So you basically mound up the soil around the base of the vine, and that can help uh, encourage root production above the point of um, where you see disease to help them kind of bounce back from the canker. Um, and another is arching, so you can reduce movement uh, of the vines and maybe pull them away from potential sources of wounding. But so it's mostly cultural management methods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. So the question is, um, if you cut the vine back all the way to the base below where the apparent infection is, will it come back the next year with fusarium or not? So because this is kind of an opportunistic pathogen, it does usually require an entry point. Um, so I wouldn't guess that it would come back the next year and already be infected, um, but it could have the causal agent growing on the surface and potentially ready to infect if there is a vine. The other thing that we're seeing that's kind of um, initial observations is I think it's surviving and impacting the roots more than we previously thought. In my inoculations, I've seen some, uh, some root dieback a little bit. So um, it's really hard to see the roots with hot plants in a yard. They're there for so long and they have really dense root systems. So. No, so the question is, um, if we know how deep the fusarium is in the soil, we don't. Uh, that's, that's a pretty hard question to answer. I think it'd require a lot of soil sampling and isolations from soil, and uh, that's probably beyond the scope of my research, at least. <laughs> so. OK, anything else? There are no more questions, but thanks, Eddie. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> They're getting the flyers in yeah. the break room that they have to keep an eye out for. Yeah. Yeah.